only a few years ago, European companies could be sure that no competitors from other EU members would enjoy state aid inside the border of the European Union, but run the risk of facing an unfair competition of subsidized European or local companies when operating abroad. And the problem was even more important in the service sector's industries. The problem was that European rules are valid only inside the European Union, and all things related to the World Trade Organization, including the enforcement of the discipline on subsidies, after the failure of the door round, were in a shambles. Not to mention the fact that the WTO discipline has never covered services. Our in-depth analysis of more than 50 preferential trade agreements shows that the European Union succeeded in regulating state intervention using bilateral treaties. The EU has indeed effectively used bilateral trade agreements as a tool to export trade and trade-related policies, including competition regulation and control of public aid. The most advanced of these agreements go beyond the WTO disciplines of subsidies because they include rules that cover the services sector and also because they define categories of admissible subsidies along the line of the green light subsidies which were included in the original text of the WTO agreement on subsidies and countervailing measures. However, they were washed away by the round's shipwreck. How the subsidy policy is dealt with in the European Union's trade agreements largely depends on the status of the partner. Indeed, a pyramid can be drawn with agreements containing use similar disciplines at the top. These include agreements with the candidate member such as Turkey and some of the Western Balkan countries, or countries with a strategic interest in developing strong interest ties with the European Union, such as Ukraine, Moldova, and certain Euro-Mediterranean countries, including other countries such as South Africa. At the other end of the spectrum are agreements that virtually ignore the issue, such as those with Caribbean countries. Some other agreements contain only limited chapters on competition and subsidies by reproducing merely WTO rules, such as those with Canada and Mexico, or by reinforcing transparency provisions, as it happens in the agreement with Colombia and Georgia. The most thought-provoking position is occupied by advanced partners like Korea and Singapore and developing countries, especially Vietnam, that they have negotiated detailed and ambitious regimes on subsidies with the European Union. These agreements are to be considered WTO plus treaties because they deepen the WTO provisions on subsidies in that they define more categories of prohibited subsidies. They seek to remove distortions to competition due to specific subsidies and, in the cases of Singapore and Vietnam, they also include rules on services. Our analysis brings us to the very heart of the subsidy issues, that is, their genetic ambivalence. Even if problematic from a competition viewpoint and a trade perspective, subsidies are not an absolute evil. They are a tool of industrial policy everywhere. They can target market imperfections by rewarding companies for positive externalities and public goods. And they can also be used in order to pursue social and distributive goals. The different ideological approach of the different countries forced the European Union to design tailor-made exceptions to the general prohibition of subsidies. The European negotiators have done a very good job, mainly in regard to state companies in countries as much different as Singapore and Vietnam. It is of high importance to highlight that the new agreements with advanced trading partners which had no need to conform to European rules, are likely to be a blueprint for imported agreements currently in the negotiation phase, including China, India and Russia, and the recently concluded agreement with Japan.